April 1981. Columbia, the first space shuttle orbiter, glides to a pinpoint landing at Edwards Air Force Base, California, ending its spectacular maiden flight. But unlike spacecraft that had gone before, Columbia would not be retired from service to become a museum piece. Its future as a space transport vehicle had only begun. After its successful first flight, Columbia was ferried back to Kennedy Space Center. There, the process of turnaround was set in motion. There were system checkouts, minor tile repairs and replacements. An experiments package called OSTA-1 was placed in the payload bay. The package rests on a platform built by the European Space Agency. The Canadian-built remote manipulator system was installed. The system includes a 50-foot-long mechanical arm. In early August, Columbia was moved over to the Vehicle Assembly Building. Here it was mated to two new solid rocket boosters and an external fuel tank. Three weeks later, it was rolled to the launch pad once again. Shuttle Flight 1 brought many firsts. Shuttle Flight 2 would bring another. The first time in the history of space flight that an attempt would be made to launch the same spacecraft a second time. During the next three weeks, launch preparation crews worked in three shifts trying to meet the early October launch date. All had gone smoothly up to the point of loading the hypergolic fuels. That process had barely begun when nitrogen tetroxide was discovered spilling onto the orbiter. Approximately 15 to 20 gallons of the oxidizer had spilled down the side of the vehicle and into the propellant tank compartment of the nose section. It had also seeped between the orbiter's thermal protection system tiles and dissolved the bond holding the tiles on the spacecraft. Eventually, over 350 had to be removed. The cause of the spill was failure of a quick disconnect valve to close. The valve could not close because of concentrations of iron nitrate in the head and hardening of lubrication in that area. With Columbia still on the launch pad, workers were able to gain access inside the nose compartment and replace soaked thermal blankets. They were also able to reach the soaked tiles. Therefore, it would not be necessary to move back to the orbiter processing facility for repairs. The tiles were put through a very speedy decontamination process to remove the oxidizer. Within three weeks after the spill, all 378 tiles had been removed, decontaminated, and rebonded. Launch was rescheduled for November 4th. But Columbia was not destined to return to space yet. Only 31 seconds away from ignition, the launch computer halted the countdown. The pressure in the liquid oxygen tank was below the predetermined limit necessary for liftoff. Meanwhile, controllers were also becoming increasingly concerned about the high oil pressure in two of the three auxiliary power units. After analyzing this problem further, they decided to scrub the launch for the day. The APUs are vital to Columbia's safe ascent and entry for steering the engines during liftoff, controlling the aero surfaces during landing, and for lowering the landing gear. It was suspected that oil pressure rose in the units because the filters were clogged. The problem would have to be solved before another launch. Analysis revealed that a wax-like substance had formed in the oil to clog the filters. 
The substance was created by a chemical reaction between the oil and hydrazine fuel. The hydrazine seeped into the gearbox over the seven month period since the APUs were last used and contaminated the oil. Although many thought technicians simply forgot to change the oil, normal maintenance procedures did not require it. Indeed, a key factor in shuttle's reusability is quick turnaround with minimum maintenance. The APUs were flushed with new lube oil. New filters were installed and fresh oil was added. Working on a very tight schedule, ground crews completed the work within a week. The shuttle was again ready to be launched. Astronauts Joe Engel and Richard Truly, commander and pilot for the second shuttle flight. Commander Engel, who joined NASA in 1966, was part of the backup crew for Apollo 14 and the first shuttle flight. Three of his 16 X-15 flights went above 50 miles, qualifying him for astronaut rank. But he had not yet been in orbit. Nor had Richard Truly, pilot for this flight. Truly, who joined NASA in 1969, was capsule communicator for three Skylab missions and the Apollo-Soyuz mission. He was also part of the backup crew for Columbia's first flight. Both men had flown the shuttle before in approach and landing tests at Dryden Flight Research Center in 1977. That was over four years ago. It was now 1981, November 12th to be exact. Richard Truly's 44th birthday. Countdown now being conducted by the launch sequencers on board the orbiter. The SRB nozzles have been moved to start position. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7. We have go for main engine start. We have main engine start. Looks good to us. Smooth and clear as used to. SRV SEP line. Roger and a SEP. 103, 103 converged. Roger, got a 103. Okay, let's get a return status here. Final. Go. Booster. Go. Prop. Go. Ecom. We're go. Eagle. Go. Okay, we're go to proceed past negative return. Mark, negative return. Roger that. Sounds good. Status final. Go. Guidance. Go. Make a hold in 3 4. Yes, sir. Booster. Go. Go at 8, Capcom. Columbia Houston, you're go at 8. Roger, go at 8. And it's solid as a rock, man. OK, 
Okay, Houston, we got a good Miko. Miko. Roger, we got Miko. Roger, Miko. And we got a Miko confirmed. And confirmed. Let's get off the tank now. Got the Miami Bites flight. No problem. Ignore them. Okay. Ignore the IMU Bites, Capcom. Columbia, Houston, you can ignore the IMU Bites. Roger, Houston, and we've had ET SEP. Roger on the SEP. Okay, let's get an Holmes 1 status here. Roger, Holmes 1 status. Booster? Go. Prop? Go. Ecom? Go. GNC? Go. Capcom, we're go for nominal Holmes 1. Go for APU off. Columbia, Houston, uh, your go for nominal Holmes 1. For APU shutdown on time. Okay, Dan, and we're maneuvering to attitude now. Roger. As Columbia continued toward orbit, the SRBs parachuted to a safe landing in the Atlantic Ocean, 160 miles downrange from the launch site. They were recovered and will be used again on a later shuttle flight. All orbital maneuvering system burns were successful, putting Columbia into a 138-mile orbit around the Earth. The payload bay doors were opened to deploy the heat dissipating radiators and expose the OSTA experiments. So began the many tasks of the five day mission that lay ahead. However, not long after achieving orbit, at about two hours, 27 minutes mission elapsed time, the crew reported a high pH level indicating alkalinity in one of Columbia's three fuel cells. The cells which produce electricity and water for the spacecraft and crew are essential for operating the many systems on board. Flight controllers, having dealt with almost every conceivable problem during flight simulations, immediately began working to find a real-time solution to this problem. But meanwhile, the cell's capacity to generate electricity continued to deteriorate. At about five hours mission elapsed time, it was decided to take the fuel cell offline and safe it, drain it of all its energy. This would prevent a potentially dangerous reaction from occurring that could damage the spacecraft. But according to a mission rule made pre-flight, the failure of a fuel cell would reduce the 125 hour nominal mission to a 54 hour minimum mission. A mission management meeting was held to decide whether to enforce or override the rule, whether to come home after 54 hours or stay up for the full duration. At a press conference on day two of the mission, Johnson Space Center Director Christopher Kraft explained why the decision was finally made to shorten the mission. Well, we certainly don't have any other problems on board. I think that we think it's the prudent thing to do uh, at this point in our test program. Uh, we think we can really get everything out of the mission that we have planned uh, with, the ex with the exception of time. So we just felt that from a more prudent position, uh, we, had, we had thought it out very carefully uh, pre-flight that uh, that was the best thing for us to do. Indeed, virtually everything was gotten out of the mission that was planned. All high priority objectives were accomplished, and 90% of the overall objectives were completed, even though this was a test vehicle on a developmental flight cut short 71 hours. Of top priority were the remote manipulator system tests, completed on the morning of day two.